Kevin Gordon here for Auto Savant, coming to you from the 2013 Mercedes-Benz GLK 250 Blue Tech, the diesel version of the little Mercedes SUV, and really a uh, pretty interesting little car. This particular GLK is about as optioned as you can buy one. The base GLK 250 comes in just about $38,000. This one has almost $20,000 in options, including paint, the premium group, the stereo, lighting, the safety tech package, full leather, 19-inch wheels. Really, it has almost everything that you can get on some more upscale and higher-end SUVs, but in the compact GLK package. Talking just a bit about the GLK itself as a platform. You know, it's a boxy little thing when you get down to it. And to me, it's always actually been pretty pleasing to the eye. For 2013, they cleaned up the design a little bit, made it a little less utilitarian looking. Um, you know, added a lot of LEDs, that kind of normal fun stuff they seem to be doing with car remodels these days. And it's still, to me, a very handsome thing. It looks sort of purposeful, even though it's small. You know, it's not sort of bubbly and round the way a lot of its competition is. Interior space is okay. The front seats are definitely super comfortable. Plenty of good room in here. The rear seat legroom isn't terrible, but the rear wheel arch does sort of make uh, entry and exit a bit inconvenient. This one also has the running boards on it, which really, if you can find one without them, I'd recommend it. All they're going to do ever is get your pant leg dirty. Uh, maybe if you have little kids that you're concerned about trying to step up into the car, it'd be worthwhile. But I know, like my kids, they just step right on the door sills, sort of have no idea what the difference is between that and the running board. But let's talk a little bit about what makes this GLK special. And it's the 2.1 liter Blue Tech diesel engine that Mercedes has outfitted to it. It's rated at 200 horsepower and I believe 369 foot-pounds of torque. With that kind of torque number, you'd expect it to be like a real sort of stump puller. And it, it isn't so much that. I mean, when the turbos fully spool and you get into the rev range, it definitely is a solid shove but it's like an eight second zero to 60 car. Around the city, it feels sort of sporty. On the highway, it's never ever out of sorts. It's just, you know, because the fact that diesels get a little wheezy in the upper rev range, a high speed passing can get, you know, doesn't give you the same sensation you obviously would get in a gasoline motor car. With that being said, you almost never notice this car's a diesel. I think it's the greatest compliment that you can give it is that it's quiet. The only time you'll hear it clatter is on startup. And if, per se, you're in the drive-thru of Dunkin' Donuts and there's a wall right next to you, you do get some clatter noise. Otherwise, Mercedes has done a really commendable job of muting all the diesel-like noises and behaviors. It starts up instantly. It seems to get warm really quickly. Uh, it doesn't smell. Like I said, there's really not a lot of clatter. You don't hear the turbos really at all. You don't get that sort of diesel wine injector noise really heavily in here. It's a very transparent diesel system. And the magic of it is pretty much any way you drive it, it's going to get 30 miles to the gallon. This car's combined rating is 28 miles to the gallon. And I have yet to see a number anywhere close to that. I've always been above it. They seem like they've rated this car enormously conservatively from an EPA perspective. I guess with some of the other things that are going on in the industry right now, that makes sense, but they're almost not giving themselves enough credit. I can tell you that we took it on a really high speed run 
you know, averaging about 65 miles an hour. And even at those speeds, when sort of the boxiness of this thing should be hurting its economy a bit, it averaged 33 miles to the gallon for 200 miles. I mean, it really is a impressive thing from a fuel economy perspective. Of course, the Mercedes system requires urea injection. They, of course, turn urea into the kinder named Add Blue, which there's a little tank in the back, and about every 10,000 miles you have to top it off. Uh, but otherwise, except for the fact that you do need to make sure you find a gas station that serves up diesel, you'd never notice. Otherwise, the GLK rides, drives, feels just like a little Mercedes-Benz. You know, you get all your Mercedes-like qualities. The steering feels pretty good. The brakes work well. The ride, even though we're on some of the worst roads around, is really well composed and pleasant without being overly soft. It isn't a rolly sort of thing, but it's nowhere near harsh. And unlike the running board, the one option, which is far from being inexpensive. The safety tech package on this car, I would highly recommend. The one complaint that I've heard from people who own these is that this pillar, you know, I'm again assuming for crash safetyness, uh, is really far forward. And as a result, you get a pretty good blind spot if you're looking over your left hand shoulder. But the safety tech package with the blind spot monitor on this car really is excellent. It also has lane departure, sort of active warning where you get the buzz in the steering wheel. And you've got full speed dynamic uh, radar and later sir guided cruise control, which is probably if not the best, one of the best systems that's out there. You get pre-safe braking. Uh, you get the little set of lights up top to let you know when you're getting close to stuff. Uh, this one's also got the parking package in it, so you get you know full ultrasonic parking sensors around it. Really, the $3,000 option that that thing is, if anything I was going to buy, I would skip the real leather that this one has because I'll be honest, I can't really tell much of a difference between this and the MB text vinyl that you might find, but that safety package really is a very nice set of options to have in the car. The rest of the ergonomics in here wind up being pretty much standard Mercedes. You get the windshield wiper thing on the turn signal stock, you get your cruise control stock down below that. The good news there is they've at least finally gone to turn signal above, cruise control below. The gear selector is a knob over here, which is a little weird, but let's face it, all the manufacturers seem to be going to stranger and stranger ways to allow you to select, drive, reverse, neutral, and park. The center stack in here, you know, you do get interesting things like Mercedes, how do you control how much air is coming out of the vents? They're beautiful little turn things. That's off that's on. Like all nice things doesn't require an accessory sort of switch or knob to control that. The complaint I'd have is they of course have their sort of knob controller for their infotainment system which works quite well. It's reasonably intuitive but you can't like if you want to control the stereo volume separately they're in two different places. Now of course it's also repeated with the steering wheel button but the ergonomics in here aren't to me, my favorite. I know a lot of people really like them. I'm, of course, a bigger fan of like the Audi system where everything is in one big place. All the functions wind up being sort of right where your hand falls normally. You're not reaching for things. It's, you know, either on the steering wheel or right where your arm rests. The final piece of this car as far as an option set went to being the Harman Kardon stereo, which I had great hopes for because Mercedes can really put excellent stereos in their cars, and this one falls a little short. Uh, it really just doesn't have quite the raw power or the bright clarity that you might expect from an additional option add-on stereo. It isn't bad in any sense. The Bluetooth that connects to your phone works well. Credit to Mercedes. You get a real USB port in the center console. But there again, from a weird ergonomics perspective, I've yet to figure out a good way, if you have your USB plug plugged in, to have the cord hanging out and still be able to close both of these. Uh, you can leave one open and have your cord hanging out, but again, 
It's just those little details, the Germans and the electronics, they don't seem to quite have the way some of the Japanese or American manufacturers have. As I mentioned, from a looks department in 2013, they updated the outside of the GLK a bit and touched a few things on the interior. I have to say, this one, of course, painted in press car brown, as we like to call them, because they really like giving automotive journalists cars that are brown. It is a beautiful color. It's a almost maroon brown, I think you could call it. And unfortunately, we've had sort of crummy weather, so we haven't gotten any really crisp, good, sunset-like photography of this car. But it is pretty. This one also, with its 19-inch wheels, the one interesting detail of those is they don't have a rim all the way around them. The spokes are sort of self-contained rims, and so it's an interesting looking effect. The storage space in the third row is okay. Um, you give up like 13 or 14 cubic feet to a midsize. Between this and a BMW X3 and an Audi Q5, they're all pretty comparable. And I, you know, again, the competitive side of that, this car, those are it. The Audi, the diesel seems to be coming for the Q5. For Mercedes, for BMW, excuse me, they obviously don't offer one. So this car really winds up being the fuel economy winner in its class. And, uh, you know, without any of the fun hybrid stuff. So if economy is really important to you, you can get this car at $38,000 if you don't take a bunch of options boxes, which is far from being inexpensive, but it's still uh, for a premium, small luxury SUV is right where it should be. It comes standard with all wheel drive, which is nice. They don't charge you an extra grand or two to have a all wheel drive SUV. And with just a few of the options boxes checked, it really is a very comfortable, highly economical little SUV that's really pleasant to drive on a daily basis. It's easy to park, unlike some of its larger competitors. Uh, really, uh, and it's a standout in the market being that it's a little diesel. So with that, Kevin Gordon for Auto Savant. Look forward to talking to you guys soon.